Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. We have a great show lined up this week, but first, let's see who's making the show possible. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report brought to you by Great Days Outdoors Magazine. Are you looking for that one-of-a-kind Christmas or birthday gift? If so, head on over to greatdaysoutdoors.com and check out the best gifts for outdoorsmen 2021. We've curated a bunch of unique gift ideas to help you find an awesome gift for the outdoorsman on your list. Just head over to greatdaysoutdoors.com slash best gifts for outdoorsmen to check it out. And also brought to you by SunSouth. The work on your property never ends. Whether your work on the land includes tilling, mowing, planting, grading, drilling, hauling, or anything in between, go see them at SunSouth. They'll help you find the John Deere tractor that's right for you with the implements that you need to get your projects done faster, more efficiently, and more affordably. And right now at SunSouth, you can get 0% financing for 72 months on select John Deere tractors. SunSouth, equipment for those that do. Some restrictions apply. See dealer for details. Offer expires November 30th, 2021. And also, advanced transmission in Spanish Fort. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com. And also brought to you by Hilton's Offshore Charts, bringing you the highest quality online satellite fishing chart since 2004. Your source for sea temps, altimetry, currents, and watercolor at hiltonsoffshore.com. Hey guys, and welcome to another special episode on the Great Days Outdoors podcast network. You know, every once in a while, believe it or not, we do take a week off and it's good to kind of dive into some of the topics that we don't get to cover on the fishing report. And I don't know about the the folks listening, but for me personally, fishing has always been a means to get protein. I mean, I like the sport fishing. I mean, I like a good fight and all that, but man, I'm fixing to eat something whenever I go out there and And fillets uh, are where it's at. That's the ultimate goal, really. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know how little I knew about fish and seafood cooking until I met Hank Shaw, uh, because this guy's done it all over the world. He's been doing it his whole life and he's devoted his career to it. And, uh, he's got a really cool cookbook that has come out. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about that today, but really we're going to be talking about how you can learn how to cook really just about anything that you catch and whether that be fish or any types of seafood and whether you're a freshwater angler or a saltwater angler it really covers it all in that book so we're going to dive into that a little bit deeper today but i'm your host joe by here with my co-host butch theory butch hey, uh man I, I would imagine by the time this airs it's still going to be hotter than hell like it is right now i would think so man yeah i got out and was able to do some fishing yesterday and got up first thing this morning and i was uh looking on hunter angler gardener cook on what is it foodhonest.net and i was trying to see what hank shaw said for scamp recipes because i got a freezer full now and i'm very excited about that well we sent hank packing with some scamp recipes i know he's already started playing with that but let's get into it man let's bring old hank on to the show hank shaw hunter angler gardener cook honestfood.net hank How's the book tour going, first and foremost? Oh, it's going pretty good. Uh, not too shabby. I uh, just got back from Minnesota, where I did a bunch of events. And then I've been, been, I was in your neck of the woods in June and headed to Alaska in August. And hopefully Delta is going to let me continue to this book tour uh, going forward. But uh, so I'm crossing my fingers for that. But yeah, I mean, Atlanta's on the list. Florida's on the list. New Orleans is on the list. So hopefully I get to do all that in the fall. Yeah. Interesting time to try to be traveling right? Yeah, it is indeed. So you're just getting started. I thought that you were kind of in the middle of it. You're kind of just getting started on this hook, line, and supper tour. I am. So I, the book came out in May and at the beginning of like the end of the weirdness. And then we had some great non-weirdness times and now it's getting a little weird again. So we're trying to figure out how to navigate all this, but hopefully it'll work out okay. Now, Hank, this is your first fish seafood really foray into fish and seafood from a cookbook perspective. You have a number of other cookbooks, right? So I think that what's interesting about this is that you, I guess, for whatever reason, started out with with hunting cookbooks, but you've been fishing a heck of a lot longer you've been hunting. I have. I actually started out with Hunt, Gather, Cook in 2011. So this is 10 years ago. And that book actually has fishing in it as well as gathering and hunting, but it's kind of a bit of a primer book. It's Mm -hmm. It's not a real deep dive into anything. So it's kind of a 
that was kind of the get your appetite wet thing. But yeah, you're right. After that, I did Duck Duck Goose, which is entirely devoted to waterfowl. I did Buck Buck Moose, which, as you might imagine, is entirely devoted to Rabbits. deer and elk and that sort of thing. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I came out with pheasant, quail, cottontail. I don't know if you're seeing a trend here. Uh, <laughs> right. And that's all like wild turkeys and quail and rabbits and that sort of thing. And then hook, line, and supper is the latest one. So yeah, I'm I keeping love, the I whole triplet thing going. Yeah, I love that. And the other cool thing about that is that you've used what you call affectionately your hive mind. Uh, you've mm. got some some big groupings of people uh, on the web that have kind of helped you come up with a lot of these names too, right? Yeah. Readers came up with both Pheasant Quail Cottontail and Hook, Line, and Supper. So yeah, that's it's really kind of cool. fun to be interactive. So tell everybody, for the folks that don't know, what you really do, you know, like day to day, what's a, what's a day in the life of Hank Shaw? And how'd you get into this? Well, I started food writing when I was still a newspaper reporter, good Lord, 15 years ago, maybe 16 years ago. Because I, I I covered politics, and as you might imagine, that can be uh, a little bit stressy. Yeah. So I, I started to look for avenues to write about something that I liked rather than something I was good at, which was food in general. And because I was a chef in, in my 20s, and so I had this combination of being able to write and this love of the outdoors and, and I don't know, decades, like, um, you know, damn near a half century worth of experience on food, fish and seafood. And, you know, I started writing uh, freelance articles and then I realized very quickly that I was going to, I had too many ideas. There was just no way for me to sell all the ideas of the things that I wanted to do. So I started Hunter, Angler, Gardener, Cook way back in 2007, and, which is funny to say way back, but it is way back right now. Yeah. And it's, it's becoming like since 2007, you know, right. uh, <laughs> established and it's been kind of this crazy whirlwind ever since I got nominated for a James Beard Award twice and won it in 2013. And for those of you out there who don't know what a James Beard Award is, it's basically the Oscars of the food world. So pretty cool, right? Especially for it's incredible, you know, yeah. a guy writing about fish and game. Yeah, that's right. I'll tell you what's cool. You talk about, you know, starting the hunter, angler, gardener, cook, and, and you're basically your tribe uh, coming up with the ideas of your book. Joe and I are finding that, you know, with kind of our tribe as well. It's it's really cool how interactive people can get. And that is one good thing the interweb has given us, I guess, This especially in this particular juncture in our lives. Right. You know, talking about that hive mind like you, you like you like to call it i mean if folks do want to find you we can kind of go that get that out of the way like sure uh, on, on social media where where do they need to go to follow along because that's what's so cool about what you do specifically on facebook is like you're you're very much involving people in the process right so the two main places that i work with in social media are instagram uh, where i'm hunt gather cook on instagram and that's kind of um you're going to see kind of what i do every day there and I try to keep that as drama free as possible. And similarly, I have a private Facebook group called Hunt Gather Cook. It's a private group. So you have to answer the questions to get in. And it is a big now, it's almost 24,000 people from everywhere from like hippie earth mothers who are vegetarians to, you know, MAGA dually drivers who only eat backstraps. And yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's fine because what happens is like, because everybody who agrees to be in there it's like no politics, no social bullshit. Yeah. And it's all just food, food, food. So if you want to know how to cook, you know, scallops better or pokeweed better or scamp or deer or, or hell, I mean, possums and nutra rats and stuff like that. They're all legit conversations on like, well, you know, with a nutra rat, you got to kind of soak them a little bit and then probably should put them in gumbo. Right. But it's, it's all like legit real helping everybody to get smarter and better with wild food. And that's what makes it a positive place. Yeah. And I love, well, and, and you make it a positive place. Cause uh, I mean, I know that we run a, quite a few Facebook groups as well. And we, I would say, but you probably reject as much stuff as what you allow in. And I've noticed more, that more probably. Yeah. I mean, you police the comments you police and not, not from a, you know, basically just to keep it a positive place. And that's what mm -hmm. I really like about it. Cause there's so few places, especially on social media where you can just go and just have a positive, ex totally positive experience. Now, the way I, the way I got linked up with Hank is I was a fanboy, and, you know, had Still been read. Well, <laughs> definitely. I would say, I would say a little less now, but uh, especially but, now that you know me. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, it was one of those things where, I love cooking uh, wild game and fish. I'm not a chef. I call myself a cook. Like I can follow a recipe, but I am not going to invent something. 
a lot of times, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking for something, I'll type into Google what I have on or what I'm trying to do, you know, so like venison, mushrooms, and asparagus, you know, and then see what pops up for a recipe that I can follow. And just, I just was always running across your recipes. And so when, I think it was when you launched Buck Buck Moose, I think mm -hmm. you were in Birmingham doing a, a book event and, and my wife and I came up to see you and we kind of hit it off and mm -hmm. got you down fishing on the Gulf, got you your first triple tail and, and yeah. many other fish subsequently. So that was a lot of fun. And then, you know, having Great Days Outdoors, the magazine, I know when I'm outclassed. So uh, when I'm looking at different things that we want to rank for online, I said, you know what? Hank's doing this very well. This is an area, <laughs> game and fish cookery is an area that I, I don't want to wade into those waters because this area doesn't, is not underserved. There's a guy doing this very well. So you've been kind enough to share your recipes with us and Great Days mm -hmm. Outdoors magazine, which I, I love seeing them in print. You know, there's just, there's just something about that high gloss yeah, image. <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, we, we've had a good working relationship and, you know, in some of the times that we have fished together, hunted together, and especially when you've been on the Gulf of Mexico with us, you have done things that I've never seen done. And, and this is not an area that is underserved either when it comes to chefs and things of that nature. I mean, I remember I took you shrimping. Oh, yeah. out of Dolphin Island and you made a risotto with the stuff that we would normally just just throw back in the water you know you use that bycatch so what's been your favorite experience on the on the Gulf Coast you know you've you've been all up and down uh what do you really like about the area man I I don't know that I could pin a single favorite on it like I I've never not had a good time um yeah. except for that I think except for the heat think... and the sun one of the more memorable ones was uh was when we were in the Keys where it was like in fact, a little over a year ago, we're like, yeah, it's going to be awesome. We're going to catch a bunch of stuff. And we just got kind of settled in. And you're like, ah, I don't know if this Rona stuff's really going to be anything. It's like, <laughs> ah, whatever, you know? And, and so we come back from fishing one day and you're like, yeah, maybe it's going to be something, but it, it'll be a while. And then we come back like this day three and we're like, hmm, this isn't ideal. And right. so like day four, it's like, we got to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But even then the singular thing that puts the Gulf and really Southern Florida waters as well, sets them apart from everywhere else in the, in my experience is the diversity. Hmm. So, you know, I catch rockfish, lingcod, halibut, striped bass, and salmon pretty much exclusively in Northern California where I live. And I catch lots of them, but it's not like I catch 38 different species. I mean, yeah, we could get all technical and yes, I do catch 38 different species of rockfish, but it's all rockfish, right? right. So uh, rockfish, for those of you listening who aren't familiar, um, there are the Pacific equivalent of snappers, virtually identical. So there's a bajillion species of them. And even though that, you know, like there's, this, I don't know, what is there a dozen snapper or something like that? Maybe two dozen? I don't even know. There's probably a lot more than we even know about, but right. yeah. yeah. But there's I mean, like 50 it's not rockfish. a tremendous amount. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> the three of us will every year we'll be like, Hmm, that's right. What haven't we Are murdered they? yet? Right. And, <laughs> yeah. And you know, we still have a few things on the list. Like I still, we still have not had a bang up cobia bite. Yeah. We still, let's see, we still needed to catch a swordfish. I think honestly we need to do tuna again because I kind of got a raw deal on that last tuna thing. I, yeah, I had, had one a, really nice had epic fin. fail on that. Well, it, drew, it dragged me into the boat. <laughs> hey, and you got cut off the do. corner of the boat. <laughs> Well, yeah, but it's just like the guy who's gaffing it, who shall remain nameless, who's yeah, not yeah. actually That's on right. this call. Right. We, know, we, all know, just... we all know who he is. Clink! Uh, uh, that was 100 pounds. Mm. It's okay. It's okay. Was a, lot of, a lot of good sashimi right there gone. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll catch another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm so sure we got that. On, we'll put that back on the list for sure. Yep. Uh, most recently was uh, Scamp. Uh, yep. We caught several different kind of groupers that day. Bunch of nice snapper. That was a fun trip. Vermillions and porgies. Vermillions. I'm sorry. White snapper. White snapper. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's one of the things that I've most appreciated about. Well, there's two things uh, as far as your culinary talents. One is, like I mentioned earlier, if, if I get an ingredient, I've got to find a recipe and then I got to go to the store and get, you know, get all the things that the recipe says to use and then follow the recipe you're very good at like, okay, I've got this and I've got that and I've got this. So you just make something. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of what your cookbook is about is quote unquote, these master recipes that like, Hey, here's the general idea. And then you, you sub, you can sub these 
components in and out to get to the end goal. But the other thing that I've appreciated about you is that you use a lot of the odd bits and, and you appreciate a lot of the underappreciated species like the porgies you were talking about. Most people are going to boneless, skinless, those things, throw them in the fryer and call it good. You don't do that with a lot of things. No, we grilled all those porgies that first night. Yeah. Grilled them whole. It was delicious. Yeah, they're all they're all really good. So, I mean, is that a is that a theme across the country that just uh, the underappreciation of certain species, or is that something that's exclusive to the the Gulf where we have this abundance of just no, all kinds no, of stuff? I mean, there's especially with fish and seafood. There, are every culture, every region, every ethnicity, every whatever has sets of fish that they deem that are good to eat and not good to eat, and mm-hmm. It's not easy to, that's actually really interesting. A, a, I think it was a, it's a study that just came out in like Nature Magazine or something like that. It's in the news this week. It was like, racism underpins, you know, what's rough fish and what's not. I'm like, yeah, I mean, there's a little of that, but I mean, it's just a hell of a lot more to it than that. It's just, it's the, it's what fish are you used to and what you are comfortable eating and what fish, you know, you, you just don't know, you know, like you could take catfish, for example, it's a great example. So in the South, and really there's kind of a catfish line. It's like somewhere around Missouri, I think, where from Missouri on South, everybody eats catfish. Catfish is just fish, right? But once you kind of get North of there, you start to get a, a prejudice against catfish for reasons known only to them. And it's like, oh, only those other people eat catfish, you know, whether it's, <laughs> you know whoever and it's bizarre because i'll i'll be up there just roping the catfish and freshwater drum the sheep's head so in minnesota and the upper midwest is the only place on planet earth that a drum is considered a trash fish hmm. like there's no like come on could you imagine like if they considered right. a drum in the gulf as a trash fish you wouldn't have anything to eat <laughs> yeah yeah we have a lot of yeah, drum no species kidding. for sure so just like hunting i i started uh, hunting as an adult and so I came in with no preconceived notions of what was and what wasn't good to eat. I just, there are some things that are not, but you know, I, I learned those myself. And for the fishing, I grew up and I cut my eye teeth on party boats in the, in the Northeast. So the New Jersey, New York area. Guilty. So if, if you're not familiar with a party boat, of course you guys are because you've yeah. got deck hands on one. But if you're not familiar with a party boat out there, it's basically a bus where everybody gets on the bus and goes fishing. You know, again, it's all race, color, creed, age, region, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's a hodgepodge of just a bunch of different kind of people. Yeah. Totally. Right. And it's yeah. really fun if you are, if everybody's having a good time and is willing to talk to your neighbor, you're going to learn a lot. Mm-hmm. And so from the time I was a teenager, I would find out that, well, why are these Asian guys doing this with that fish? And then you ask them and they're like, oh, well, it's really good for broth or it's really good for stir fry. It's just, so you find out all of these different recipes that are not battered and fried or grilled and you're like, oh my God, that's, and then you try them at home. You're like, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so what happens is that just becomes another page in your own personal mental cookbook. And then, you know, flash forward 30, 40 years later, you got a pretty big mental cookbook. I think just seeing what you do, like I said, with those underappreciated species, not, not always fish, but it's almost like you just need one good experience to make you want to like start to seek out Try a lot more I yeah, agree because you're like well dang if that's that good and we've been throwing that away for all these years or letting the crabs have it i'm like what else have we been missing for sure and it's a and it's a lot the answer is a lot i a got lot. a funny story for you that so i went fishing for salmon and lake trout on lake michigan out of wisconsin a couple about a month maybe two months ago so even you guys as as gulf people know that the bellies and the collars of a salmon are kind of the primo bits right they're the fattiest they are you get that salmon grease running down your chin. It's this it's the part that everybody wants. <laughs> On good salmon ears, I only eat bellies and collars because they're the fattiest parts and I give the fillets away. I fillets only leaner. eat bellies. Right? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, this is, this is, and then everybody uh, who's on our fishing party is the same way. So apparently that's not the thing that you do in Wisconsin. So I was that guy. And I told the guy that like, no, man, I'm cutting my own fish. I'm just, no, sorry. I'm cutting my own fish. And he was all mad. He was mad that we were bleeding fish too. And we can get into bleeding in a little bit. Yeah. But short version is the, the oilier the fish is, the more it needs to be bled. So he was annoyed at that. So finally we caught a lot of fish. We had it. We actually as grumpy as that guy was, he was a very good fisherman. So we caught a lot of fish. And so we let him fillet most of them. And oh my God, his, I've never seen anybody do this fillet technique before on a, on a salmon or trout. Basically he made a, a horizontal slash to remove the belly 
and then cut in front of the collar and went whip back and gave you like this long rectangular boneless filet. That was the worst part of the fish. Right. <laughs> like the whole rest of the fish went over the side and like, oh, like. <laughs> yeah, because in a lot of cases it was either he, he probably didn't think it was good or, you know, or it was the fastest way you could fillet it. It's not the fastest way. That's the really funny thing. It's like the fastest way with a with a salmon or trout is to come right behind the head because their bones are so soft, right behind the head, whack through that the top of the collar because again their bones aren't too too hard, and you go whoop, and then just take the whole thing off with the collar because it, that collar that arch collarbone gives you a handle to move it to somewhere else. So you can go flip, 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 right. flip, and like super super fast. It's probably because his clients really didn't want the fat of the belly which makes me sad. Well, they just didn't, they don't, <laughs> don't know what they don't hurt. know. Yeah, well, it does. And a lot of this comes down to the care and the preparation because there's little things that can end up making a big difference. Like I'll use snapper throats as an example. Mm -hmm. For years and years and years, I would pull snapper throats and then try to scale them. And if you've ever tried to scale a snapper throat that you've already pulled, it is horrible. horrible. It's, it's horrible. So what ends up happening is you're eating the snapper throat and you get a scale in your mouth. And that's equivalent of like getting like a fingernail in your food. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's not almost for, exactly yeah, for me. It's, repu it's repulsive. Like, I'm just like, no, I do not want to get a scale in my mouth. So somewhere along the line, I don't even remember. I was like, you know, it'd be a lot easier to scale those throats before I fillet the fish. And I started scaling the throats. Then fillet in the fish then cut in the throat and it was like you know an epiphany oh, and now i love snapper throats because of it same thing you know it's all about prep so you know you have done some commercial fishing in alaska where you like you're talking about bleeding those fish what are the biggest mistakes people are making when it comes to prepping fish on the boat so that it's better table fare i mean this fortunately this is not usually a problem with southern fisheries because it's so damn hot that <laughs> You'd be a Your moron ice. not to have right. buckets and buckets and buckets of ice. That said, I, it needs to be said because I have fished in the South and eh, that'll be fine on a stringer. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's still alive, but as soon as it dies, it's like, mm, why is my fish so mushy? Eh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> so, yeah. so when it comes to ice, I mean, yep. no, what's the best practice? The absolute, I mean, this is, Good luck getting this, but I mean, if if in a if I were emperor of the universe, I would make sure that there was sea ice slurry on every boat because you know you get a twenty seven degree sea ice slurry that will literally keep fish in pristine condition for days. That's the the gold standard. But just simply crushed ice with seawater, even though it lowers the you know salinity because you're adding it's fresh ice and seawater, it still really really helps a lot a lot. So. Barring that, just crushed ice. Barring that, a block of ice, you know, but you really want to be able to set your fish in a salty, icy environment in an ideal world. You know, that would be the number one. But bleeding is even before ice. And I, I don't know if you guys remember that time we cut all those sheep's head mm -hmm. that I bled all my sheep's head. And when we, we used that killer dock too, didn't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I think you took a video of it and yeah, yeah. And so I've cut these fillets off and like, there's no blood at all. And, you know, you guys fish is like a bloody mess. Stark difference. Yeah, stark. Huge and so, it, and it's not just aesthetic either. The fish is less fishy. The fish stays firmer and the fish will keep longer in the fridge if you bleed it on the deck. I had always bled tuna. Mm -hmm. So tuna, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, I, I don't know where I picked that up, but it was like, oh, tuna, you got to cut it. So we always bled tuna, but I'd never bled anything else. Well, let me, let me, let me interject Not even jacks. Here. Nothing. Hmm. And so I, I think this comes from a mass amounts of fish. You have right. 30 or 40 people on the boat. So you, and I, I just didn't know, truthfully, I, it wasn't something that we practiced. And I learned how much I was missing out on whenever I kind of slowed things down and put it on a much smaller scale. You know, I mean, being a party boat, that's a mass production kind of deal. I mean, it would have taken days or, I mean, you couldn't have yeah. ever bled out every 80 single snapper. Yeah. You know, you, what two guys got to bleed 80 snapper. It's like, mm, not going to do that. Unless well, I'm yeah. But what I do on a party boat like that is because I know, and this is what I want. I'm like, Hey man, you guys got an extra five gallon bucket. And if they say no, I've got one in my car. Mm -hmm. And so you just bring a five gallon bucket, put seawater in it, pop the gills or cut the gills. If it's like grouper, by the way, pro tip, don't stick your finger in the gills of a, of a grouper just to pop it. 
Agreed. Ask me how I know. Yeah. It's like it's like a garbage disposal in there. Oh my god, it totally is. <laughs> it is. Uh, so yeah, you just cut the gills with a shears or a knife for your fingers, and then put face first into a bucket of seawater uh, or fresh water if it's a freshwater fish, and that's good enough. I mean, is it? Are there better methods? You bet. But it's good enough, and it doesn't take a lot of space. And it makes a huge difference. I've definitely. Definitely slowed down and, and started paying a lot more attention to details since I picked up your first book. And uh, this one, this Oklahoma Supper one is really cool. And I really like how it goes into everything from even if you buy your own fish, hey, here's what mm -hmm. to look for. This is how you catch your fish, how you prep it, to, you know, bleed and ice. So, yeah, I mean, I think that the prep is, is something that's so often overlooked. And, you know, we do occasionally buy some seafood, uh, not usually as fish, but a lot, you know, like shrimp and mm -hmm. crabs and things like that. So when it comes to that, if you are, you know, hitting up the, the market and you're going to get some seafood, what's the indicators of, of fresh? Cause that, that's the other thing too, man. I don't think for folks that say they don't like seafood, you do hear of those, those people. Mm -hmm. I just don't think they've had good seafood yet. I really don't think they've had good seafood. Yeah. Like they never had it like truly fresh maybe they have you know but when you're at a fish market and you're going to buy something what, what are some of the things you're looking for hank number one is is do some internet research in your locality and find if there is a good fish market sometimes there is sometimes there's not and you know where was i oh birmingham so when i was in birmingham there are like three that are like legit fish markets that fly stuff in and get stuff in by, by truck every single day. And, or at least, you know, four or five days a week and good turnover, a real fish market. So if you have that start there, that's where you can actually buy fresh fish. And, and there are freshwater commercial fisheries too, that in certain parts of the country that will have like fresh walleye or fresh perch or fresh catfish. So look for that too. It's not always, it's not always seafood. If you don't have that, and that's the majority of the people listening to this, then you're going to want to go and like, you're going to end up go to a Publix, right? Or some other supermarket. My advice is just to skip the fish aisle altogether because the fish aisle is virtually always going to have thawed fish previously frozen. And so that's not great. Strike one. Yeah. Strike one. So, yeah. so, but right next to the fish uh, thing is the frozen aisle. So you look at the frozen fish and seafood and you buy that. So for example, this is less so because you're like you're in shrimp land, so you can get really good shrimp down there. That's actually what but... we call it. This shrimp, shrimp land. land. <laughs> shrimp land. There's Welcome a to shrimp land. There's a bill. Welcome to shrimp land. <laughs> oh, so a good example, like just a little side note on shrimp. If you're at a, a fish market and they have head-on shrimp and they look good, buy them and use them that day. Shrimp will tell you if they're bad because there's mm -hmm. like a black ick that kind of mm -hmm. forms where the, the head meets the body. Yeah. And so if you're seeing a bunch of head-on shrimp with black ick, go to the freezer section. But if they look nice and pretty, buy them and say, hey, stop everything. We're eating shrimp tonight because head-on shrimp are the best. The reason being is the same reason why head-on fish are the best because when you pull the heads off shrimp or fish, that portion of the meat, which happens to be the thickest, biggest portion of the meat, which I eat right behind the head, gets exposed to the heat and it can overcook much easier. So hmm. head-on shrimp and head-on fish are going to be more juicy, less dried out. And then of course, with the case of a shrimp, you can always suck the heads just like you do with crawfish. I've never done that before. I can honestly say that. Did not know that su sucking a shrimp head was a thing. How about you, Joe? I only knew because of Hank. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, full disclosure. Now, the other I bonus... have always been weird in that I've, I've always liked to eat. Uh, you see a lot in uh, like with fried shrimp, they'll leave the little tail segment of, mm -hmm. and I've always eaten that. Everybody else, you know, they'll kind of have you eaten have the fins eaten, or just that little section of shell? Just a little tail, the little tail piece. You've actually eaten the tail fins or just the little section of meat that has the shell on it that's attached to the tail? The whole dang thing. Hmm, okay. I crunch it all up because it's just right. that kind of crunchy, you know. I'm glad you said that because to me, that we, we talked about underappreciated species being a thing, but I think there's these underappreciated parts mm -hmm. of fish and of seafood and like, the heads, for example, some places they'll like fry the heads whole and just eat the head, you know, yep. um, the best shrimp stock ever too, by the way. Hmm. Yeah. That's one other thing I've learned from you is when people, I think a lot of times when, when I think of like using the whole fish animal, whatever it is, I'm thinking like, okay, so I got to eat the part with all the guts in it. Right. And 
like you're not going to be like staring at me yeah right pot or something and what i've learned is like you're not you're not actually eating it like you would a piece of fish but you're using its flavor to make something like a stock a base you know something that adds what i what i call in you when i eat the food you cook hank it's like i eat these there's levels of flavor in there that aren't normally there because instead of using water you've used a shrimp stock Mm -hmm. so what do you think the most underappreciated part maybe it's different from fish to seafood to but what do you think of of fish itself the most commonly discarded yet best part of any given fish and it's kind of a toss-up between the collars and the bellies I, i have seen untold numbers of delicious you know fish bellies go over the side Mm-hmm. And this is what you pay the most money for in a sushi place. Mm-hmm. And fish fat in general is really good. There are exceptions. You know, for example, I caught a really giant lake trout in that on that Lake Michigan trip I mentioned. And so I'm not sure that I want young women of childbearing age or children eating a 25 year old lake trout because of the because it lives in the Great Lakes. But I don't care because I'm not having kids. And you know, <laughs> and so it's like whatever. It's, it's delicious, and I love it. Yeah, and so there are there are some cases where fish fat is questionable, but in in general, especially with tuna, you're fine. So everybody's, I guarantee, you there's somebody out there listening to me, like, well, what about that guy who got mercury poisoning? Mercury, that's what I was gonna say too. Well, <laughs> shit, that guy ate that guy ate tuna like six days a week. He ate seven pounds for thirteen days straight. <laughs> Something like that. I mean, he, yeah. he was admittedly like a sushi addict, and he ate nothing but like addict. fatty tuna. And it's like, okay, fine. We now know how you're going to get mercury poisoning, which is so unreasonable for any normal human being that you know, don't 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 worry about it. So, but bellies is one, collars is is another. But I think I'd like to say that I'm having some small influence on the greater angling public much like i have had some small influence with the hunting public with shanks i am having some small influence and in, and in, in helping people um say no you really want to eat collars that you want them grilled broiled or smoked and they're unbelievably good and the reason why is because the fillet is like the back strap mm-hmm. it's nice it's clean it's lean all the rest of the fish is like all the good parts of a pig that you know we know like, like mm-hmm. sure, you can have as many pork chops as you want, but you're not going to get, you're not going to get the shoulder. You're not going to get the right. jowls. You're not going to get the hocks. You know, I want those. It's like, and so the shank and the belly is that part of a fish. So it, it, different textures, different levels of fat and different shapes of the muscles. Like there's a, um, do you know about the oyster in a, in a bird, you know, yep. where the, right along the backbone? Yeah. 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 So the same thing exists on the pectoral fins of, of a big fish. So there, the muscle that makes the pectoral fin move is shaped exactly like the oyster on a, on a bird, and it tastes virtually the same. It's a very, very cool texture. It's, I mean, it's one of those things where I don't, yeah, nobody gets them but me. Yeah. Man, I, I, <laughs> I, I uh, mine. Butch, you remember when I fried you those snapper throats and we went mm-hmm. up to the, hunt, we went up to the hunting camp the next day, we were eating cold fried snapper throats and you would have swore on, it was, like a big chunk of chicken. It, was a, it was a chicken thigh. I mean, it looked like a chicken thigh. It it was really good, like you say. Well, what would you rather have if somebody gives you a if somebody gives you a steak? Do you want one on the bone or not? And I just there's a mm-hmm. lot that little connective tissue just adds more flavor. Some people don't like that. I get it, but I thought you were gonna say skin. I really thought you were gonna say skin. That is also something that I tried first with you. Skin. It's was funny it. because you know why I didn't say it because I I didn't occur to me that people don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. That, I've well, only seen that done once, and that was you. <laughs> well, and it's funny because, like, you go to a seafood restaurant anywhere in the South, you get a fr- fried flounder, it, that joker's coming out. Scaled, whole, skin on, great. Everybody loves it. Same thing with freshwater. You go eat brim nine times out of ten, you're eating them skin on, scaled, and people love them. And most people would put, you know, fried flounder, fried brim, like, top of their fried fish list in, yeah. in the area. And so, I, I mean, personally, those are – two of my favorites for frying fish uh same thing with the the collars or the uh, throats as we like to call them and mm-hmm. you know uh, we're leaving that skin on so you've actually i've actually seen you make fish rinds oh yeah pork call rinds. Down yep. here. <laughs> fish pork rinds triple stuff. tail yeah <laughs> yep. yeah delicious 
So that it's it's admittedly kind of chefy, but it's a fantastic. It's if you ever want to like blow someone away, or if you ever feel the need to to serve uh, a pescatarian or or a, a non pork eating person, mm -hmm. make pork rinds with fish skin. It works with pretty much any fish skin, and it's ridiculous. Yeah, very it's really delicious. really yeah. good. All right, guys, let's take a quick break and hear from some of this week's sponsors. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Fishing Chaos, fishing tournaments coming up near you. Fishing Chaos invites all high school, college, and social fishing teams slash clubs to create a free team or club in the Fishing Chaos platform. Clubs can hold tournaments within the high school team or invite rival teams or clubs to compete in the CPR catch photo release events, as well as the live weigh-in events as Fishing Chaos supports most any tournament format. The addition of the new Fishing Chaos club management module allows teams and clubs to easily communicate with their members about upcoming events. It automates the tracking of the Angler of the Year as well as Team of the Year series standings and collects all Angler results. If you're interested in setting up a free club or team or in hosting a tournament or the fishing on the Fishing Chaos app, please contact Fishing Chaos today at fishingchaos.com or call Jesse Wilson at 256-508-1853. And also brought to you by MB Ranch King. MB Ranch King hunting blinds and feeders are built to last right here in the USA. With durability and convenience in mind, MB Ranch King's maintenance-free blinds are constructed with high-grade steel and come in a variety of sizes to meet any hunter's needs. They offer high-quality, easy-to-use corn and protein feeders that can be filled with both feet on the ground. Call Kevin today for more info or a quote at 205-807-2937. MB Ranch King, built in the pursuit of perfection and also brought to you by Test Calibration. If your diesel has low power or is consuming excessive amounts of fuel, these are common signs that your turbocharger may need to be rebuilt. Don't waste your money online with the cheapest options where you get no support after the sale. Test Calibration has been selling and servicing diesel, turbochargers, and fuel injection systems since 1976. No matter if you're running a diesel in your boat, tractor, or truck, Test Calibration can help you. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. And also Boaters List. Boaters List is your new reliable and fast resource designed to link everyone to everything on the water. If you own or run a boat, you know how difficult it can be to find the right company for the task at hand. Boaters List makes it easy to find the service that you are looking for. Locate anything from fuel docks to service repairs or rentals of large yachts, even down to paddle boards and all things in between. BoatersList.com will always strive to make it better on the water. So I'm glad that conversation has gone there because what we said earlier, it really just takes that first initial like good experience to make somebody have this quest to man maybe i need to start trying to cook that part of the fish or cook that part of that game that i got and we talk a lot on the podcast about conservation and it, you know every time that topic comes up it, you know the, the subject of lower limits comes up and things of that nature and it's like man you know if you were really using everything you could use you just you don't need as much you don't need to catch as many or keep as many, especially if you're eating them fresh. So if you were going to give somebody a gateway drug into the odd bits, <laughs> uh, you know, of, of seafood, what, what would it be? Where would you start? I mean, the easiest way is just to keep the skin on some of your fillets. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the easiest is to scale the fish before you fillet it. And then you get that crispy, crispy skin when you sear it hard. And I mean, that's kind of another thing where like the, the kind of the gateway drug to second level of fish cooking is to do that style of, of sear that you get in a good restaurant where the fish, the piece of fish that you're served, either skin on or skinless, will have the side that the skin was on or the skin side seared super crispy. And yet it's somehow not overcooked. And the way they do that is by searing only that side and basting the other side with, with hot oil and butter until it's just opaque. And so you have this unbelievable juxtaposition of just buttery perfectly done fish with that crispy top and of course the top is always served up uh so it stays crispy and then if you keep that skin on you'll be like oh yeah that guy was that guy was right that was really good it's kind of yeah. like crispy chicken skin which if you don't really if you don't like crispy chicken skin i'm pretty sure you should just, just go to china or something yeah turn this yeah. off that's one of the, that's <laughs> one of the turn best this things. podcast off yeah <laughs> that's the best part and I, I would say i would even take that a next step further and say my wife now loves, you know, fresh whole grilled like a like a vermilion mm -hmm. snapper or the red porgy. And if if I could make that presentable for her and for her to like a whole fish, I think that's pretty much the next level for a lot of people. Yeah. And it's super easy and it's super delicious. And they look cool. Yeah, they do look super cool.
But I think it can be a little bit, of, you know, intimidating for somebody that's been eating fillets their whole life to have a whole fish on their plate. I think it's because they don't know how to navigate it. And yeah. so the there's a lot of little tips and tricks, but the easiest way to navigate it, a whole fish, if you're presented with a whole fish, you, keep in mind the lateral line, the, you know, the, the horizontal line that's basically bisects the side of a fish north and south. That's your guide. And then remember that you, you can all imagine a fish skeleton in your head where the, the bones all point backwards towards the tail. Start at the lateral line and lift backwards as you imagine that the bones are. And you will lift just meat and you leave all the bones with the skeleton. If you lift the meat off of a whole fish any other way, you run a real risk of bringing bones with you. Whereas if you lift it up and away from the center line, you will lift big pieces of meat and then you'll have few or no bones with it. And that's that's a really, really good way to get people to to be less scared of a whole fish. We should do a video of like me nerding out on a fried brim because I caught a bunch of brim last time I was visiting with my brother. I fried them all up for everybody and everybody was freaking out because there's bones in it. And I'm like, well, all you got to do is, you know, pop the dorsal fin off, pop the caudal fin. Like you do these five movements and then you're left with no bones in what you're eating. Mm-hmm. And it's just like you said, it's just, I've been doing it so long. I already knew how to do that, but it's intimidating for people that sure. they don't want to swallow a fish bone, you know? Newsflash, if you crunch it with your teeth, you know, you're, the things that are in your mouth, um, you can eat fish bones. <laughs> teeth work. <laughs> hey, I don't know if, yeah, we don't. <laughs> oh, I know where you're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Bluefish. That was one of the things you turned me on. Oh, yeah. Dude, like three or four years ago, we had some delicious bluefish. I think one of them was Spanish and one of them was bluefish. And I forget which one the empanadas were, but man, that was amazing. <laughs> No, you cooked it. Those are good. Well, and it was back to the bleeding thing and the getting it yep. cold and the cooking it fresh. And, you know, you get into all that in the book, which is more than we could ever discuss in a podcast. But you do talk about what to do on the boat, what to do back home. I mean, there's a there is a lot of things that people do constantly. I mean, like letting fresh water, letting your fillets get soaked in fresh water. You know, I mean, there's lots of things that people do wrong that is devaluing the quality of their mm-hmm. a lot their fish and seafood here's an easy trick for everybody too is because I'm, I'm presuming that pretty much everybody listening to this will eat frozen seafood from time to time when you want to eat your fish or seafood that's been frozen take it out of the freezer take it out of its package and wrap it in paper towels obviously put it in a container and let it thaw like that in the refrigerator it takes a day but you know that's kind of a small price to pay for eventually you'll have fish that has no smell. So what happens is, and this happens with a lot of people, is if you have a vacuum seal piece of fish and you let it thaw in the vacuum seal piece of fish, it is basically marinating in kind of- It's all stank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so by wrapping it in paper towels and changing those paper towels once or twice when they get wet, the stink stays with the paper towels, which you then throw out. And then even a Makes fish sense. that- might have had a bit of an odor to it. Will not if you do it that way. That's going to change your life. And if you've got somebody in the house who I don't cook fish in the house, it stinks. Mm. This will help your interpersonal relations in your household. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That is a great. That's tip. a great tip. Yeah. I mean, because that's applicable to everybody almost with just about all the fish they they eat. You know, I mean, well, I love to cook fresh fish, but the reality is, I'm such a great fisherman. I have to freeze, mo- you know, a lot, like all a three lot, a lot, pretty much every single time. I mean, right. not to mention like <laughs> us three amazing fishermen, but right. you know, even people right. who are only reasonably okay. You know? Right. <laughs> Yep. You have to freeze something every now and again. That's a great way to get back in the game. I like that thawing. Oh, tip. another tip too. If you have a chest freezer, fish always go in the chest freezer. So, because it's colder and this is enormously- As opposed to the freezer on your fridge. Correct. It is enormously important with Northern fish because at least Gulf fish live in hot water. We don't mess with those Yankee fish on here. Right. If you're catching Yankee <laughs> fish or like Alaska fish- you know, your refrigerator is more or less the same temperature that it lives in. And so, you know, your, your dead piece of cod sitting in a 36 degree refrigerator, which incidentally is a reasonably cold refrigerator, is kind of the same temperature it lived in. Hmm. Whereas if you put a piece of Dorado or, or Mahi that was living in 86 degree water in a 36 degree fridge, that's a hell of a lot colder and it mm-hmm. will stay fresher longer. It's, just, it's also why catfish that's interesting. and like catfish and, and, brim and and you know a lot of these freshwater fish from inland from the south 
when you have them in the fridge, I've had catfish stay perfectly good for 10 days in the fridge because I mean, I caught it in, the, in water that was like 75, 80 degrees and I kept it in the fridge and I, you know, I bled it and iced it when on the, on the deck. And, you know, you have an advantage in the South where your fish will stay in the refrigerator a couple days more than it will from with fish in the North. Speaking of that, you know, we were talking earlier about the belly being one of the more underappreciated parts of the fish. It's, it's underappreciated. I have my reasons. I think why people don't fool with it, but it, the reality is it has a higher fat content. So mm -hmm. when you're dealing with fish that have a higher fat content or parts of the fish as in the belly, is that going to spoil faster? Like if you were going to say like, all right, here's this fish and you're going to eat the whole thing fresh, but you were going to do it over the next five nights what parts would you prioritize as this is what's getting cooked tonight? I think you're right. I think, you know, the fatty parts first always, uh, in, and the fatty parts don't last as long in the freezer either. Now that said, you know, if you pressure bleed and, and five mil vac seal, a fatty salmon and you put it in a chest freezer, it'll last a year. Yeah. It's not a problem, but yeah, I mean, but most people are doing that. I mean, most people correct. are dealing with the, <laughs> the these the, that kind of quality uh, uh and that kind of processing equipment yeah i mean i would say like if you got a tuna belly or a, a amberjack belly or or anything that's super fatty what are the other really fatty fish down there king max swordfish probably one of the fattiest oh man sword yeah sword, sword belly, belly is, is melt in your mouth it's literally yeah. like swordfish belly is like eating it's like ribba fat it's on a pork chop is what it's like mm -hmm. butch do you think mm, i'm uh, getting really hungry yeah so <laughs> I mean, when I was a kid, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I always said, man, I don't want to eat that belly meat. That's the fishy part. Did you hear that a lot? Well, man, I like I told you. Yeah. I mean, I, I wasted a lot of fish. I mean, really, it, we, if it wasn't fillets, we, we didn't eat it. I'm going to need you to say four Hail Marys, three hours. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> fish gods. But I heard that involved. too. And, and I think I know what you're driving at is because if, I mean, when I was a kid, we used to be able to catch unlimited bluefish and bluefish are greasy, oily. And we would just, you know, throw them in a garbage can. I'm not kidding. There'd be a garbage can on deck and like a big garbage can, you know, like one that's as tall as, tall as your hip and we just chuck them in there and it'll be fine. No ice, no bleeding, no nothing. They're all, I don't know if you've ever caught a blue fish, but if you haven't caught a blue fish, it's essentially a piranha fish on meth. And they're just like, <laughs> oh yeah, they really are. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, I mean, same thing on the charter boat. I mean, you know, honestly, we had like, you know, we had baskets running up and down the side of the boat and like you might fish a spot for 20 minutes. Well, if you caught a fish at the beginning of that stop, that fish was going to sit in the basket for 20 minutes until we got done. And then we'd string them all up and there was no bleeding. And so it was almost like, and, and then same thing. The other thing I see too, that, you know, you get back and everybody throws a fish out on the dock. It's 95 mm -hmm. degrees and the old white fish dock pick. I love it. No yeah. Idea. But I mean, that fish is degrading while you're doing that. And oh, yeah. then, you know, you, you think about taking the belly and so it's already started to spoil. And so then you put it in the freezer and let it sit there a little bit longer. You take the fish out and it smells bad, tastes fishy. And that's the experience most people had either with belly meat or just with fish in general. One easy tip for that deck shot, you know, where you got everything on the dock and you're trying to take that shot, just hose the dock down first. It's going to drop the temperature of the dock by like 50 degrees. Yep. And you know, just hose it down. Just make it freshly wet and put your fish down, take your photo, and then move on. Um, it's just a real simple way to just drop, yeah, drop the temperature. Yeah, we've started doing the same thing. And whenever mm -hmm. you literally, you know, whatever you have baskets or the big carts, mm -hmm. dump them out. Hold them up, take a picture, put them back in the carts and put the ice that was in the cooler back on the fish or put the fish back in the cooler and bring the baskets to you to clean them like that. So we've been, been way better about that for sure. Hank, what's the craziest thing you've ever eaten in terms of fish and seafood? And then what's the, what's the seafood you just can't make taste good? Well, I'll answer the second one first. Um, pogies. <laughs> Pogies. yeah, <laughs> yeah. you call them pogies in the south and then hayden or bunker where i'm from yeah. that doesn't surprise me at all and they're a combination of super oily super fishy and super soft Jeez. so it's like i don't even like using them for bait they're great striper bait they're but great yeah. anything everything eats a pogey. they're great bait i just don't like i mean i don't like using them because they're so nasty they just they disgusting are, no, oh, dude! Favorite fish. <laughs> They're vile. <laughs> bowfin are challenging too because bowfin have like arrow tooth flounder in Alaska have an enzyme in them that once the fish dies, it tends to turn the meat to like wallpaper paste in in very short order. 
So by, here's another good tip. So everybody in the South who catches fish and like, man, that fish is mushy. Well, A, yeah, you caught it in a freaking pond, a farm 90 pond. 90 degrees. Really, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so the answer to, uh, to mushy fleshed fish, which happens, especially in the South, is fish cakes. Fish cakes is the, is the end all be all of like, oh, I caught a bunch of crappies or largemouth bass, which I like to call ditch pickles. Um, <laughs> We've adopted that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, but the meat's going to be mushy. Fish cakes. Yeah. Always fish cakes or croquettes or fritters or, you know, fish hush puppies or whatever you want to call them. But, but that's the answer to mushy fish. But so that's the gross. Menhaden is kind of the grossest one. The craziest, I don't know, sea cucumbers are pretty weird. I ate them. They're not terrible. <laughs> they're not delicious, but they're not <laughs> horrible. Right. That's like it's, not how you want to be described. Like, you know, yeah. well, honey, what did you think about this young man that took you out on the date? He's not terrible looking. He's not terrible. <laughs> he's not, you know, a terrible conversationist. He's, he's mind bogglingly forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you're the sea cucumber. Right. <laughs> I am the sea cucumber of the dating world. If I were uh, to, not if I were horrible. To that. I'm trying to think what else is a, like a C thing that was like, meh. I'm not that adventurous. You, you know, thinking? I'm, I've had the, the, I've had fish livers in any number of ways and it's just, I'm, I want to like it. I, you know, the best I can happen. get is it's okay. Fava beans and a nice Chianti. I would much rather have chicken livers, fava beans and a nice Chianti. <laughs> than... What's something, what's something that everybody likes that you don't like? Mm, that I just don't love. You got him. I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to yeah. like running through things that like, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I, I don't mind that. I don't know. I don't know about like, I mean, I can tell like in regular foods, it's cottage cheese. Cottage cheese is evil. <laughs> like, what, what exactly is it? I don't know. I believe it's, I believe it is in fact cellulite. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what it looks like. Yeah. I don't know. I like most food. I don't have a food that everybody likes that I can think of where I'm just, I don't like it, but I do have a, I do have a thing that lots of people do that I it just irritates the ever loving mess out of me, and that's soaking stuff. Yeah, I just don't. I mean, I see it all the what, time with venison. Hey Joe, when you when you shoot a deer, what Man, exactly should you? <laughs> let me tell you what I like to do. I like to take that deer and soak it for about about seven days, and then finish it off in a Coca Cola bath for about forty eight more hours. It really <laughs> makes it nice and tender. Get real tender. Get all that blood out. I have been adopting that for like since ever since you first did it. Like right. re hunting in Montana, so I'm like, hey, hey, what do you do with your deer? Like, oh man, tell you what, take that deer. <laughs> <laughs> I like to Italian salad dressing for about nine days, and then uh, finish it off in Sprite. Really and I'm, a, and I'm allowed to make fun of these people because I are one. Because we are the people, <laughs> right? <laughs> It's not just Southerners who do it, though. But people soak fish, too. Yeah. That's another thing. Milk. Um, I don't understand that. The milk, I can actually understand. A brine, I can understand. Yeah, brine's different. But, like, just soaking it in water, and it's like, it's gone. If it's that far gone that you need feel like you got to soak the bat out of it, then it's, it's too, already gone. probably too far gone. It's unsavable. Yeah, I mean, just find a cat. Get <laughs> <laughs> Go fishing again. Yeah. Yeah. Get some fresh fish. Absolutely. So back to the book a little bit. I mentioned it earlier, but the cool thing about this book is it's, it's got great recipes in it, but it's going to teach you how to cook, not necessarily what to cook. Mm -hmm. Talk on that and why y'all designed the book the way you did and expand upon my butchering of what I just said. <laughs> what I found was, this is why this is my fifth book and not my first, even though I have more experience with fish and seafood, is because I needed to think about cooking fish and seafood in a different way. Because for all the time I've spent in the Gulf, for all the time I've spent in the Northeast, in the Midwest, in the Pacific Northwest, in California, everybody has different fish, right? And with very few exceptions, there are almost no fish where it's like, this has to be a recipe for X. Mm -hmm. And if you put Y in it, you, you ruined it. So uh, that kind of experience over and over and over and over again, like, okay, so... I'm going to teach people how to do these master techniques of cooking fish. So poaching in water or in fat. And when I say water, I just mean not fat. I mean like wine or pickle juice or whatever it is that you want to poach something Seven in. Seven up. Literally, there is actually, I mentioned that. Uh, <laughs> so in the upper Midwest, there's a fish called a burbot, which is like a, a, a codfish. 
they say boil it, but that's a bit much. But if you simmer it gently in in Seven Up, I kid you not, it's a little bit like lobster. Yeah, I believe it. And it's like it's super lowbrow, but very good. So like a kind of like a poor man's lobster. Right. Right. Yeah. So poaching, frying. I have an entire chapter on frying because uh, everybody in the South just became your biggest fan. Everybody yeah. on the planet we, loves fried we, fish. We love you now, Hank. Yeah, there's like seven or eight different styles and varieties of, of frying fish in there. Uh, and I, they're all tested. So I've got grilling, I've got smoking, I've got salting, I've got raw stuff. You know, I've got an entire chapter on like fritters and balls because like, you know, love me some fish balls. Right, for sure. <laughs> Just want to put that out there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, like all kinds of things that, that I, it's kind of idiosyncratic because, yeah, there's no, there's a couple of baking recipes in there. But in general, like a piece of baked fish bores me to tears and I want to jam chopsticks in my eyeballs. I'm like, okay, <laughs> just bake some snapper. It's really good. No, it's not. It's not the good. topping that you made is good. The snapper it just tastes isn't good, you know. Bland. So when I would design a recipe for X, so here's an example. I have a recipe that sounds esoteric, but it's not. Uh, it's Thai fried pomfret, which sounds like, whoa, that's trippy. First of all, it's Thai fried because it's just yeah, it's cornstarch is the is the dusting instead of anything else. Uh, and you could use tapioca starch or potato starch, but it's like a starch uh, outside versus a breading. And then there's a Thai dipping sauce, which the only thing weird in it is fish sauce. And even I've seen that at any Publix in the South that I've been to. So, but pomfret, like what the hell's a pomfret, right? So they're, they're, you can catch them in the Gulf. There's an Atlantic I called, my, pomfret. called my first one last year, actually. You I, did? Oh, cool. I did, yeah. But there is zero reason why you can't do that with a pompano or right. you can't do it with a brim or a crappie. And then I was like, well, yeah, those are all sort of the same shaped fish. What if you used, you know, vermilion? Yeah, it'll be fine. What if you used the same technique with squid? It'll be fine. What if you use the same technique with a, a Key West lobster tail? Also fine. So like, yeah. I just went through over and over and over again and like, well, okay. The only things like you probably wouldn't want to do this for, it would be like a, I don't know, a mackerel. You wouldn't want to do it with that. You wouldn't probably would not want to do this recipe with bluefish, but so it's far easier in a book like this to tell. And I will tell you in the head notes that like, use whatever you got, except for these three or four things, which would be, mm-hmm. you know, and still, even if you want to go for it, but I think it's gross. Like I hate breaded and fried mackerel. I think it's disgusting, but it's a big thing in the Philippines. So like there are Filipino restaurants here in California. They'll always serve fried mackerel. I'm like, yeah, I mean, grilled mackerel is good, but I'm not going to bread and fry it. It's nasty. So even in cases where I have a strong opinion about something, there are many instances where some other culture is like, yeah, we like it. So yeah. that kind of sets you free to like, just get the technique right. That's the thing. I think that that's the underlying of all of it. Like you said, is getting that, getting that technique, right. I've watched you cook and I've seen you doing things. I was like, man, I just would never thought to have done it that way because I didn't know the technique. But the other thing was like, I've been your quote unquote sous chef some, you know, where I've been chopping for you or, or just doing them like, well, your recipes in the ceviche says to use one habanero, but I have one jalapeno. You're like, do I need to go to the store, get a habanero? You're like, no, it's fine. And so, you know, I was like, well, it says, you just did that actually. Yeah. It was like, it says, you know, three limes and two lemons for, you know, a pound of fish. Uh, Do I just double it for two pounds? And you're like, yeah, it doesn't really matter that much, you know? So like, that's (laughs) the difference. You got to get there first. Yeah. You know, I'm obviously an engineer's son, you know, and uh, I have to have it, uh, everything lined out just perfectly, but this is what's going to teach you how to have fun. It, It makes it more fun when you don't have to be so rigid. Yeah. And I will tell you in the cases where like, there are certain cases where like, no, you need this much, or right. this is super important. One example is if you are dry salting fish to then smoke it or cure it, that matters. Like mm-hmm. the amount matters a lot less than the time. So long story short, if you are dry salting a piece of fish to then either smoke it or cure it, it goes in for one hour per pound of the piece that is being salted. So if it's a half pound piece of king mackerel that you're going to smoke, it only goes in, you know, you can bury it as much salt as you want, but it only stays there for half an hour and then you rinse it off and, and let it dry and smoke it. So that's, that's one of those cases where that matters. And, but other than that, like, yeah, cause you're going to, yeah, I mean, you could, you could put it in there for three days if you wanted and then, you know, it'll keep for until the second coming. Right. But, fish jerky. <laughs> be fish jerky. Right. Yeah. 
And I actually have a recipe for fish for the second coming. <laughs> like I, I do an entire section on bacala, you know, the salt, salted fish that can literally keep in your refrigerator once it's dried. I mean, hell, it could actually keep in the freaking pantry for years because it has almost no active water content. So that's, I mean, it takes two days to rehydrate. This is what fueled European expansion all over the world is these salted fish because they don't go bad. Smoked mackerel is actually pretty good. You ever had it before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a recipe in there for uh, smoked bluefish pate that I do with Max. So quite a bit. Smoked mullet, smoke mullet's pretty good too. I, I yep. like smoked mullet. I like bluefish. I like Spanish mackerel. One of those things that everybody tells me, you know, like it's pretty good if you do this and that. that my fish is king mackerel. I just can't make. I've tried king mackerel five ways from Sunday. I'm I've not followed. A huge fan either. I've done everything I could do. You know, king I've cared, ball. king I, balls I've is the best. Is the best for them right. I've bled them. I've massaged them on the way in. You know, I mean, I did like. <laughs> <laughs> everything I could do to make King mackerel taste good. And I'm just going to let somebody else have those. I'm just, that's okay. That is okay. And maybe, you know, maybe I just need to get Hank to cook them for me, but yeah, I'm challenge accepted. Yeah. Let's I mean, Spanish all day long, Spanish right. mackerel all day long, um, little small mackerels. And maybe, I don't know, maybe it's because they were bigger and they, the flake was bigger. I don't know, but that's my just nemesis fish. I can't make myself mm. like it. Speaking of the second coming, Butch, I'll ask you this question first. You know, what's your what's your death row meal when it comes to seafood? Mm, dead man walking. What am I eating? Yeah, Whew, man, that's a tough one. I um definitely gonna have to be either sword or scamp for sure. Man, I think probably just keep it very simple: garlic, lemon, salt, pepper. It's really fresh. You're, and butter. you're more about uh, more about the freshness than the elaborate. Doesn't need a whole nature. lot. I think so. What about you, Hank? I mean, I agree in the sense that really good seafood, and this is why the, t the book is so dedicated to technique, is because really good seafood just needs one or two things to play harmony with it. That said, I've got plenty of esoteric recipes because, you know, you can't eat perfect fish every single day because even then you'll get bored of it. Like, oh, I've had lemon and garlic for five days in a row. Right. But in terms of- I'm a, tired of eating scamp bellies. Uh, right. I actually- let let the peasants uttered, eat the fillets. I have uttered the the term the, the phrase "mom lobster" again, um, right? <laughs> because mom is a Yankee from New England, and there was one time in my childhood where lobster was literally cheaper than chicken. Oh uh, wow! And so we ate it like six days in a row. I feel so that sorry said, for you. Yeah, it, rough. That might be my deathbed meal. Is I want main lobsters and drawn butter, and keep them coming until I'm dead. Right. Like I ate nine at one sitting once. I like cold water lobster for yeah, sure. I, I've Maine never lobster. had, I've had Maine lobster, but I've never had like a Maine lobster in Maine. And I feel Agreed. like Same it's here. gotta be, it's gotta be different. I don't know. I mean, you could have it in anywhere in New England. It'll be great, but yeah, it doesn't have to be Maine, but, it, but anything once, once you get South of Connecticut, it's not the same. Yeah. For me, man, I would eat myself into like meat sweats with soft shell you would, crabs. You would kill yourself oh, before yeah. they got to kill you? I would, I would, it would be death by soft shell crabs. They, yeah, they would come in and they'd be like, all right, we're ready. And it, I would already be gone. I would just, I, I could. Yeah, and you have half of one sticking out of your mouth. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, I would, I just, if you get a good fresh soft shell crab that's cooked in the right fat and fried, fried just right, you know, where it's not overly greasy. Dusted in flour and fried in bacon fat. Holy moly. Mm. And I would probably have to mix in like a uh, a really nice piece of French bread and a po' boy, you know, like have a few of them on po' boys and then just just finish me off with a Rochambeau of, <laughs> of you know, just a platter of fried soft shells. You know, a bacon, lettuce and tomato good. sandwich with a mm. with a, a fried soft shell crab on it. That's hard to beat. Pretty close to awesome. Yeah. Hard to beat that for sure. No doubt. Well, man, you know. We have caught a lot of fish, Hank, since you've You have you've to come, come out down. And, and come to Salmon Nation and catch some stuff up here. Is that what y'all call it? Like, the shrimp, salmon Land? Is it Salmon Land up there? Uh, we're the <laughs> bottom of Salmon Nation. So Salmon Nation starts around the San Francisco Bay, um, Monterey. If you, We can let them in because they sometimes catch salmon. But it's really like San Francisco Bay to Kotzebue, 3,000 miles to the north. It's what we live for. I mean, it's, it's what we do. Yeah, I mean, big, giant, greasy pig kings. I mean, I have two that I'm working with right now because I caught them on Saturday. And every part of that fish, with the exception of like the, the gut cavity, which is small on a salmon, is useful. I mean, I made a miso soup out of a salmon broth and just used the meat off the head. So the meat that I picked off the head and the cheeks, 
with some noodles. Oh my God, was it good? Like so good. And smoke the belly, smoke the tail sections. We're going to grill the collars for tacos. You know, you could, it's great raw. I mean, it's, it, Sam is to us what probably grouper is to you guys. Ooh, not to get up there then. Cause grouper yeah, is another, I'm in. another big favorite. I'm down. You got to get you down. We're going to go chase these swordfish. Mm -hmm. Get on. Get those those dialed in too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We got a lot of, a lot of guys. They're really, uh, the Northern Gulf fancy is, boats. is coming up out of there. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. Go fast boats, monkey boats, as we affectionately call them. <laughs> yep. But well, man, uh, it's been fun talking to you, Hank. I, I know there's way, like I said before, there's way more in this book than what we could cover in one podcast, but it's a, it really is a great book. Thank you. And I'm not just saying that because I want you to cook me more stuff. <laughs> I, mean, I, am, I am saying that because I want you to cook me more stuff, but that's not the only reason. But we're telling the truth. Right. Yeah. So if folks want to check out the book, mm -hmm. would make I bought a bunch for gifts. It would make a great gift. Or if they want to come see one of your tour stops, mm -hmm. maybe pick up a signed copy, uh, meet you in person. Where can they go to get all of that information? So all of that information is going to be uh, on the website, which is Hunter Angler Gardener Cook. Uh, there's a tab that says book tour, which will tell you where I'm going to be. Spoiler alert, I will be in the South and Florida in November. Uh, I don't have exact dates yet, but that's the plan. You can also buy books directly from me and, uh, and that helps me out. Or you can buy them through Amazon. Uh, you can buy them at your local bookstore or wherever fine books are sold. And that helps <laughs> Jeff Bezos go to space more. It does. Right. It does. It's this, if you don't it's like Jeff Hank, if you just haven't liked Hank's voice or, you know, if you see him somewhere and you just don't like his face and you want to help Jeff Bezos go to Amazon. Go to Amazon. <laughs> I actually, I mentioned Amazon because A, yes, I still, I still make some money off it, but B, I can't, I can't match their shipping. I just can't. So if like, if you've got to have that book tomorrow, go with him. Uh, but yeah. if you can wait a few days, uh, go with me. And there's a tab right on the website to, to buy the book and it, and it, you can help a guy out. Fair enough. <laughs> Well, Hank, we're looking forward to getting you back. Thanks for joining us and uh, sharing some of your expertise with us on the on all the all the podcasts. And uh, it's going to go out on all of them. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Do you have any uh, other cookbooks in in the plans? You thinking about anything else? You got an idea? You so, don't have to tell me what it is, but do you? In have fact, any? Um, several days from now, I get on an airplane and I go to Mexico, mm. and it is for a intensive language course that I'm taking. And mm -hmm. so I can already speak Spanish, but I'm, I'm not really totally fluent and I need to be totally fluent because the next project is I'm co-writing it with a really good friend of mine who's from Mexico and we're going to write a Mexican cookbook, but it's, cool. that'll be, that'll be a little while. It's Very awesome. Cool. As always, man, we enjoyed having you join us again and uh, we'll be looking forward to the next time. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being on the show, Hank. Man, that's an awesome segment. This week's show is brought to us by Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. And also brought to you by the Alabama Marine Resources Division. The Alabama Marine Resources Division reminds all recreational anglers who harvest gray triggerfish, greater amberjack, or red snapper that their catch must be reported through Snapper Check. This includes vessels, kayaks, and shore anglers who possess any of these reef fish. Reporting is mandatory and must be done prior to landing fish in Alabama, regardless of where the fish were caught. Anglers can report to Snapper Check online at outdooralabama.com or through the official Outdoor AL app. For more information about Snapper Check or any of the 2021 fish seasons please visit outdooralabama.com all right folks that's going to wrap it up this week you guys please subscribe rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts if you'd like us to email you the podcast each week just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767 again just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767 subscribe to our email list and we'll send you the new show each week you guys keep whacking them we'll talk to y'all next week this week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report brought to you by me, Angelo DiPaola, The Coastal Connection. Find us online at thecoastalconnection.com. And also brought to you by Fish Bites. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits as well as tackle at fishbites.com. Also brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. And also brought to you by Photonis Defense PD Pro Ultralight Ultra Compact Night Vision Systems. Simply the best in-class night vision systems ever built. 
Contact them at photonusdefense.com to learn more. Photonus Defense, Masters of Darkness. And also brought to you by Killer Dock. Killer Dock uses marine grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun. Killer Dock combines durability, function, and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience. Visit KillerDock.com to see more. And also brought to you by Foster Contracting, the fortified roofing professionals at Fortified Roofing Pros. With them, you're making the smart choice. Check them out at FortifiedRoofingPros.com or call them at 251 451- 447-2978. And also brought to you by Sam Stop and Shop is your one-stop shop located at 27122 Canal Road in Orange Beach, Alabama. Sam's has a little bit of everything, including a deli, inshore, offshore, and surf fishing tackle. They also have bait, clothing, groceries, name brand sunglasses, and so much more. Stop by and shop or call them at 251-981-4245 today.